Uh, well, thank you very much, Walter, and uh, welcome to everyone. Those of you that are uh, here in person uh, in Barrie, and those of you, the many of you that are joining online, we appreciate you taking the time that, today to uh, look into this very timely and relevant uh, topic, presentation that we look, we're gonna look at this afternoon. Uh, really this two-part question, is the world out of control or fulfilling Bible prophecy. Now, just before we do get started, I should mention that uh, all these slides have been made into a handout. Uh, those of you in, in, here in the hall can pick up a copy. Uh, if you would like a copy sent to you, just email the, the email on the screen there, barrychristadelphians at gmail.com, and Grant will make sure that we send you an e-copy. You know, there's many people in the world, probably the majority of people in the world, at times ask the first part of this question. You know, is the world out of control? I would suggest to you that very few consider or ask the second part of this question. Is it fulfilling Bible prophecy? You know, that might be because they're biased against against the uh, the Bible, uh, or perhaps they're unaware that many of the things that we see happening in the world today have in fact been predicted uh, in the scriptures. And uh, that's what we hope to uh, to look at um, this today. So, you know, it's been quite a week, hasn't it? Uh, it's, it's been uh, incredible, really, lots and lots of news from the, the, the Queen's funeral to the ongoing conflict in the U Ukraine and uh, Putin rattling his saber and threat making threats. Um, and, and perhaps one of the, 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 the biggest things this week has been the, the 77th Assembly of the United Nations. And uh, not that they were discussing this question, but you know, the, the United Nations uh, Secretary General uh, in his opening speech uh, really answered this question from his perspective. And I would think that he thinks the world is in fact out of control. We've just got a short clip here. Hopefully it'll play. Uh, let's see if we can make this work. So uh, here he is. This is, uh, you know, the cbc.ca headline was, our world is in per peril. The United Nations Secretary General warns the General Assembly. So let's just listen to him here. And, and as he's speaking, um, listen for what he says and maybe what he thinks the solution might be. Our world is in big trouble. Divides are growing deeper. Inequalities are growing wider. And challenges are spreading farther. Let's have no illusions. We are in rough seas. A winter of global discontent is on the horizon. The cost of living crisis is raging, trust is crumbling, inequalities are exploding, and our planet is burning. People are hurting, with the most vulnerable suffering the most. The United Nations Charter and the ideals it represents are in jeopardy. We have a duty to act, and yet we are gridlocked in colossal global dysfunction. The international community is not ready or willing to tackle the big dramatic challenges of our age. This crisis threatens the very future of humanity and the fate of our planet. And did, did you capture some of those uh, sound bites? You know, the, the very existence of humanity and, and our planet are at threat. The, uh, the gridlock and the, the global dysfunction. Uh, you know, he, he talked about climate change and he talked about the, the the disparity between the rich and the poor, and that no one seems to have the willingness or the desire to act. I would think that you would agree that in summary, he was saying our world is out of control. I, I wonder, did you hear anything about a uh, mention of, of any solutions and, and who might offer those solutions? Was it, was it the, the United Nations? He, he said that they're in jeopardy, they're just they're, they're so dysfunctional and um, you know, I, I think he would say that we need to get our act together. Mankind, human beings need to solve these problems. I don't think he mentioned God. And uh, I don't think he would, uh, he mentioned at all any of the fulfilling Bible prophecies that we see in the events that he was uh, so passionate about speaking about. So that was interesting in light of our discussion this afternoon. Our world. Our world. Now, this might be a map that some of you are familiar with, uh, maybe not this mall in particular, but you go into a mall and you look for the, the map, the, the directory, and uh, those, those big, bold words, you are here. I don't know about you, but this is a, a comforting thing. You, you, get your, you, know, you get your perspective, 
you get your bearings. Okay, that shop is on that side. The you know the, the big store is down there. I'm I'm here, so I know where I am. I've got my bearings. Uh, but of course, the other benefit of a, of a map like this is if you might have a destination somewhere in the mall that you want to get to, uh, this map can show you how to get there. So not only do you know where you are, but you get an idea of where you want to go and how to get there. This is very, very important. Well, uh, there's several passages, prophecies in the Bible that I like to call the you are here prophecies. And uh, this one I suggest you look up if you have a Bible, you might want to make some notes in, in your Bible. If you have a device on which you have your Bible, you could color code different parts of it. Uh, but here it is, Ezekiel 37 verses 21 and 22. And it begins like this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. Now, you may not be familiar with uh, all the history here, but in AD 70, the Roman Empire, the Roman nation came down upon uh, the nation of Israel, in particular the city of Jerusalem, and destroyed it, AD 70. And uh, Israel ceased to exist for almost 2,000 years, and they were scattered uh, into, uh, into all parts of the world from that day forward. Uh, but God says here he's going to gather them and bring them back into their own land. Well, that began in the late 1800s into the early 20th century uh, as, as uh, Jews from around the world for various reasons, uh, persecution and pogroms and, and various reasons came back to the land of Israel and, and be, you know, became farmers and, and traders and, and worked the land. Uh, and they started to come back into their own land. And you can highlight that in your Bible or put a mark right beside that part of the verse that says about 1890-ish to about 1947. The verse goes on to say, I will make them one nation in the land. Well, that happened in 1948 when uh, the, 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 the world once again recognized uh, a, a nation called Israel. Uh, you know, prior to 1947, if you had any world map, it wouldn't have said Israel anywhere on the map there. But from 1948 on, even though it's small, right there in the middle of most maps in the Middle East, you see the nation of Israel. And so that part of the verse was fulfilled in 1948. The next part of the verse in Ezekiel 37 goes on to say, not only are they going to be one nation in the land, but they'll be on the mountains of Israel. Now, the, the mountainous part of Israel, we know today as the West Bank, and um, Israel didn't have control of that after uh, in 1948 in the War of Independence. But in 1967, they took control of the mountains of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And so there you go. You can mark that, highlight that in your Bible and say that was about 1967 to the present. The verse then goes on to say there will be one king over them all. Now that hasn't happened yet. We've got two verses here that so show some successive prophecies with a successive years of fulfillment. And if you wanted your map, you're right here, just before this last section of the verse. Uh, so we've seen Israel now on the mountains of Israel. It's a place called Israel again. Um, but there isn't a king yet. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to return soon to the earth. So we could mark, you are here. Now that can give us our bearings. We, we are here in Bible prophecy. So what's coming next? All these other things have been fulfilled. We can expect the next thing to happen will be Jesus to return, become the king of the Jews and the king over all the earth. So that's a, a you are here Bible prophecy. And, and there's a couple of others. Let's keep an eye open for that as we go through our presentation today. Now, this is certainly a uh, valid question, you know, can we trust what the Bible says? Um, you know, the, the Bible makes a very emphatic claim about this, and it's very bold. Uh, for example, here in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, God says, I am the God, I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Now that's a very bold statement that, that God can predict the future. Unlike any other God, 
the idols that the, the nations around Israel worshipped, they were just wooden stone. God claimed to be a, a real and, and, a, and a living being that knew the end from the beginning, that was involved in their lives, that has a purpose, and that will do as he pleases. Now, either that claim is true, and the Bible is true, or this is one of the greatest frauds of all time. Now, Jesus, who not only was a great teacher and a, a loving uh, a master and, and gave himself as a sacrifice for all mankind, he was also a prophet. And many of the words that he spoke, we would call prophecies, the, uh, the Olivet Prophecy being the most famous. But in, in fact, the, the book of Revelation is Jesus' words to his, his, his servants. And Jesus said to his disciples here in John 14, 29, I have told you now before it happens. Now he was talking about his coming death and resurrection. He says, I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. And I think that's a really good uh, thing to understand with respect to all Bible prophecies. We've been told these things beforehand, before they happen, because God knows the end from the beginning and he's revealed these things to his son and his son has told us so that when these things come to happen, when they, when they happen, when, they, when they're fulfilled, we can believe not only that the Bible is true, but that the things still coming that haven't yet been fulfilled will in fact be fulfilled. So what we hope to do in the next uh, section here, in the next few slides, is you might say look at a few test cases. Can we find uh, scriptures, uh, prophecies that have been written, that men have read and understood, and been able to predict might, what might be coming down uh, the, in the future because of the Bible prophecies? And uh, this is one of the, the, the key ones, I believe, the nation of Israel. Look what it says here in Jeremiah 31, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations, proclaim it in, distance, in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. And we've talked about this one already with the Ezekiel 37. Here's another passage in Jeremiah uh, 31. There's many, many passages in the scripture that are similar to this. Now, it's talking about God scattering Israel. That happened in AD 70. And that he's going to gather them, which began, you know, in the early parts of last century and kind of culminated in 1948. It's got to be the same Israel. Whatever Israel scattered has to be the Israel that's regathered. Now, the geography has to be the same. Where they were scattered from is where they're going to be gathered to. Um, so we've seen that. Uh, here in Isaiah 60, verse 9, another angle on this same uh, topic, uh, God says, Surely the islands will look to me. In the lead are the ships of Tarshish, bringing your children from afar. He, he's speaking of Israel. They're going to they're gonna have assistance in being brought from afar with their silver and their gold to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Now, we don't have time to look into the details of this. That would be an entire presentation of itself. Uh, but what the Bible refers to as Tarshish, ancient Tarshish, is modern day Britain and, uh, and, and the, the, the nations associated with Britain. Um, now, many Bible students were able to read this prophecy and others and write things like this. This would be a commentary on these uh, many scriptures that talk about the return of the Jews to their homeland and the fact that the ships of Tarshish or the British Empire would assist them in that return. So here's, what, here's what's written. I know not whether the men who at present contrive the foreign policy of Britain entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the Holy Land and of promoting its colonization by the Jews, their present intentions, however, are of no importance one way or the other, because they will be compelled by events soon to happen to do what under existing circumstances, heaven and earth combined could not move them to, to attempt. The present decisions of the statesmen are destitute of stability. The finger of God has indicated a course to be pursued by Britain, which cannot be evaded, and which her counselors will not only be willing, but eager to adopt when the crisis comes upon them. So here's, here's a man who was able to read the Bible, read some of those scriptures that uh, we, we just quoted there, Ezekiel 37, 
um, and Jeremiah 31 and Isaiah 60, he was able to put that together and say Britain will be involved in helping the Jews return to their land. He didn't claim any divine special revelation. He was just reading the Bible and, and seeing what it said. Now, the man's name was John Thomas, and uh, these words were penned in 1848. So that's a long time before any of the events actually fulfilled. When John Thomas wrote these words in 1848, there wasn't even an Israel on a map of the world. It didn't exist. And Britain had certainly no intention of helping Jews go back to that land. But uh, 70 years later, we'll have a look at the Belfort Declaration. And almost, well, exactly 100 years later, in 1948, there was a nation of Israel once again in the world. So um, we don't have time to go into the, the history of this. It's a fascinating history lesson about the, you know, the, the First World War and this, this declaration by this Lord Belfort uh, in, in 1917. And we'll just highlight a portion of that. This section of it reads as follows. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Now, after the World War I, uh, there was the British mandate over Palestine in the middle that area of the Middle East. And this uh, was now part of government policy that they were going to help uh, the Jews return to that land and establish their home there. And uh, many Bible students had seen this event, not exactly, they didn't know when it would happen or exactly how it would come about, but they knew for certain it would. Um, another interesting commentary here on Israeli and Arab relations, uh, you can see from the slide there, it's taken from a, a website, Bible in the News, which is a fascinating website about how uh, events foretold in the Bible are um, being fulfilled in the news headlines all around us. And here's a quote from that website uh, in 2010. And uh, this is another passage that we'll make a reference to um, a couple of times uh, through our presentation today. And that is Ezekiel chapter 38. Our first one was in Ezekiel 37 about the return of the Jews. This is the next phase in this prophecy, Ezekiel 38. And in verse 13, uh, the authors of, of uh, this on this website here say, we read of a group comp uh, comprising Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. So there's Tarshish again, the British power. With all the young lions thereof. So, you know, the, the Commonwealth nations, we call them, you know, Canada and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, India, and, uh, and so on. Now, this one is focusing on this Sheba and Dedan. And they say, they say clearly here, Sheba and Dedan are countries belonging to the Arabian Peninsula, modern Saudi, Saudi, Saudi Arabia and Yemen and the Gulf states. This must surely mean, they surmise from this passage in Ezekiel, 30, uh, yeah, Ezekiel 38, this must surely mean that we can expect to see an alliance between the British power, Tarshish, and these Arabians. One that is likely to be based on commercial interests rather than military considerations. And this Anglo-Arabian economic coalition, the emergence of a pro-Arab foreign policy in Britain should not be a surprise to those who study the prophets. That those, uh, do, that, those, hmm, that, those that does not mean a complete rejection of Israel, however, a British government would doubtless maintain a position of compromise seeking to please and appease all sides. Now, that's quite a bold statement to make in 2010, that uh, a nation friendly with the Jews uh, and the Jewish people themselves would have any kind of relationship, positive relationship with uh, an Arab country. And that lo and behold, in August of 2020, we have these Abraham Accords. Now, Britain isn't here in this picture, the, the West is represented by President Trump there, the United States, but you can see Bahrain, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates signing this accord. Um, and it was called the Abraham Accords, which is itself fascinating. And, and if you look into the, the history of that, um, we see here the, the accords are named after Abraham. That is the Abraham of the Bible, Genesis, starting in Genesis 12, to emphasize the shared origin of belief between Judaism and Islam both of which are Abrahamic religions that strictly espouse the monotheistic worship of the God of Abraham. 
So yeah, there's even a religious aspect of this, although primarily it's about um, cooperating economically, but they see their common origin. And, and I must admit, I don't think many in the media saw that coming. It, it seemed to come out of nowhere. They could hardly believe that uh, this, these Arab nations and Israel and the West could cooperate in this way. And yet, as the, the, the Bible and News website said, if we were reading the prophets, if we were studying our scriptures, uh, Sheba and Dedan cooperating with Tarshish and being friendly to the Jews, uh, the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel, uh, should have been something that we could see prophetically. Now, one final, one final example of this, you know, can we trust the Bible, is the relationship between Britain and the European Union. Uh, once again, there are many, many passages that would be behind the, the, the points we're about to look at next. A statement like this made again by uh, this man, John Thomas in 1850, where he wrote, Britain cannot be included among them. And the them he's referring to is the toes of Europe, the toes of Europe. Now, he's making reference there to a prophecy in Daniel, Daniel chapter two. We can't go into detail, but it's of this large statue uh, that, that highlighted the successive empires that the world has seen, ending with the feet and toes of iron and clay. And uh, John Thomas says here, Britain can't be a part of the whatever's going on in Europe. They're, they're separate from that. Um, here in 1981, uh, Graham Pierce in a booklet he wrote said, though we don't know how it will happen, Britain will separate from Europe. Now, Europe and Britain had been cooperating for many, many decades uh, from the 50s and on. Uh, it was kind of, I guess, formalized, I guess you might say, in the, the Maastricht Treaty, which was signed in, in, uh, in 93. Um, but here, uh, Graham Pierce could see that whatever was going to happen in the future, what was happening at his time, he didn't know how it would happen, but there had to be a distinction between Britain as the, the ships of Tarshish and the, the prophecy that spoke about Europe. And probably this is the most uh, clear and bold statement made by Paul Billington in 1990, so 30 years ago. He says, she, that is Britain, is therefore perforce not part of the European system when these prophecies, the prophecies that we've been looking at, Ezekiel 38, uh, Jeremiah 31, all these prophecies we've been looking at, when these prophecies are finally fulfilled. And then he says, just clearly, Britain's eventual exit from Europe is a certainty. And again, not because he had any claim to any divine or personal revelation, but he read the Bible. He looked at these prophecies and he could see that the prophecies about Europe and the prophecies about Britain were distinct. They're two different camps, if you will. And uh, I thought this was particularly interesting that uh, in 1990, 30 years before Brexit, uh, Paul Billington was basically able to use this, what's now the slang that is common. You can, you can Google Brexit. It's now become a term that we, we understand. He said Britain's exit from Europe, Brexit. He said it's going to happen. It's a certainty. And that was 30 years before it actually did. So there's some examples of, yeah, the Bible can be trusted. We can, we can look through as prophecies are being fulfilled and said, we are here. You know, you are here. These things have been fulfilled. This is what we expect to come next. And we can have the confidence that it is, in fact, going to happen. Now, what we'd like to do is uh, look at various um, modern current events, we might say. What does the Bible say about certain things? And our first one here is, you know, what does the Bible say about social issues? Um, so here's, here's a quote from uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, the first four verses, and we're just going to read this. What, you know, as, as you read this, notice that it begins by saying, you know, mark this, take note, there will be terrible times in the last days. So yes, there's probably always been these sorts of things going on, but we're going to see an escalation of these things. And in the last days, that is the time just around uh, you know, the end of the world as we know it, when Christ will return and establish a new world order on earth, uh, the kingdom of God on earth, when, when God's will will be done on earth as it's now done in heaven. Uh, this is what it's going to be like. Let me just read this to you. And you tell me if this is, uh, you know, a, a great 
description of the world that we know today. Uh, Paul prophesies and says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know, certainly a sad commentary uh, on today's society, especially what we call the Western society, when there's just this abundance of money and obsession with self. You know, if we had a modern translation of that first phrase, uh, I would probably put it like this. People will be lovers of their selfies. Uh, that's a thing now. You can the one picture there. You can see it's it's now it's that's now a word that's come into our into our uh, terminology. Selfies. Uh, certainly, money is is promoted as the solution to all our problems, and so on. Um, you know, if we were to do a, a "You are here" in this one, how through how far through that verse are we now? I'd suggest you we're at the end of that one. That has come to pass as a, a prophecy of the last days. So what does the Bible say about environmental issues? You know, this is a, this is certainly a hot topic today. Yep, that was pun intentional. It's a hot topic, you know, climate change and, and you know, all these, these issues, even at the UN this, this week, all, many of the speeches revolved around how do we solve the problems that the planet is facing? What did, what did the, the Secretary General say? He said, our planet is burning up. That's what he said in his opening remarks, and that was a theme throughout the week. Well, here, this is Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8. This is, this is Jesus speaking. This is a prophecy from Jesus, and he says, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And so, yes, there are famines uh, throughout the world. You know, and, and many of them caused by the, 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 the climate change that is the fault of, of humankind for the most part. You know, really, it's a sad reminder of our poor stewardship of, of the planet um, and cries out for divine intervention. You know, the Bible says all of creation is groaning and waiting for that time of, of restitution, that time when Jesus will return and, and put things right. Uh, certainly, that's the way to fix the root problem. Um, like the Secretary General said, we're, we're almost out of time to get these problems solved. You know, pestilence is there. That, the idea behind the Greek word there is, is disease or, or, or viruses. You know, there's the, you've probably heard of this thing called COVID-19 that like shut down the planet. You know, the, there's always been famines. There's always been pestilences. There's always been earthquakes. But there's an escalation of these things as we come into what uh, the Bible calls the last days. Uh, just an example of this, this, um, this jumped out at me. This was uh, just this past week on Monday on Yahoo News. Uh, this this uh, headline just jumped out at me. Outbreak is a threat to the whole world. And, you know, you wonder how many things we don't even hear about as the, as the world is dominated, the news is dominated by, you know, the war in Ukraine and COVID-19. And certainly this week, the United Nations Assembly and, and uh, the death of uh, the funeral of the Queen. So, how many things don't we even hear about? But look at this one. Apparently, there's a, a cholera outbreak in, in Syria, in Damascus, and they're, they're flying in medical aid. Um, but this, uh, this director, this World Health Organization's regional director, uh, talking to the Associated Press here, says at the end, it is a threat to Syria, to the region, to neighboring countries, and to the whole world. You know, this, this escalation of, of things uh, like pestilences and diseases. So the Bible has a lot to say about things that are current and relevant in the world today. Now, we'll look now at, at, at some nations that are mentioned in the Bible um, or, or groups of nations. And the first one we're gonna look at is Russia. We've already mentioned um, Russia uh, in, in our, our discussion so far. Now, we don't have the time to look up all these passages. Again, get a hold of the, the handouts, email for them or pick one up here today um, and check these out. So we'll just read through these. What does the Bible say about Russia? Russia will have influence over Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, Eastern Europe, and Turkey. And again, a lot of those, uh, that comes from Ezekiel 38. 
Um, Russia will use deceit to control Western Europe. Some of that comes out of Daniel chapter eight. Uh, Russia will have a well-equipped and devastating army and navy. They'll be intent on invading Israel to take a spoil. Well, maybe we've just from, jumped from the, yup, we've seen that to, oh, that hasn't happened yet. You know, you are here somewhere in these in this, this sequence of, of events that we expect to see. They will be opposed by Western nations. We see that divide. We've seen the Cold War. We've seen a heating up of the Cold War in, in, recent, in recent months. Um, there will be a crafty uh, liar, who, a ruler who uses deceit. In Daniel chapter 11, he styled the king of the north. And of course, that's because it's the nation's north um, of Israel. So Turkey and then Russia, as we see that, you know, that a line directly north of Jerusalem goes right into Moscow. Uh, there will be an overwhelming invasion of the Middle East, uh, and and will he, uh, the, the the nations uh, that are aligned with with Russia uh, will come down. They'll invade Israel and then go into down Egypt, and take spoil into Egypt, and then return. It says in Daniel eleven to set up some sort of headquarters in Jerusalem. Will that be like a military base? Uh, will it be will it be religious in nature as they they claim some of the the holy sites that are important to the Russian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem? We're not sure. We just know the Bible says these things will happen. Uh, that that invading force will be militarily destroyed by divine intervention. Ezekiel thirty eight uh, says that clearly. Um, now, will this uh, this Russian force be led by Putin? Is is Putin the the man? Is is he the Gog that's spoken of in Ezekiel thirty eight? You know, we can't we can't be sure. We can't say that for sure. We don't know how soon these things will happen. But what we do know for sure is that Russia, the nation of Russia, will fulfill these prophecies. Doesn't matter if it's led by Putin or, or by somebody else. Um, it is interesting to note that Putin seems to tick a lot of the boxes. Now, he's a great candidate for this, this leader uh, of this invading force. Um, you know, he's recently threatened to use nuclear weapons, but we don't know for sure it's him, but we know for sure that Russia is destined uh, scripturally to fulfill these things. So what do we see in the headlines then? Well, here's an interesting quote. It's, it's, a, it's a couple of weeks old now, um, but this is from the Ukrainian president of Oldemir Zelensky, uh, September the 3rd, in, a, in an address to, to his people. But I think you can see here, he's speaking to the whole world and in particular to Europe. And this is what he says. This is his assessment of what's going on. He says, these days, Russia is trying to increase the energy pressure on Europe even more. Gas pumping through the Nord Stream pipeline has completely stopped. Why do they do this? He asks. This is his answer. Russia wants to destroy the normal life of every European. It wants to weaken and intimidate the entire Europe. Where Russia cannot do it by force of conventional weapons, like they're doing in Ukraine, it does so by force of energy weapons throughout Europe. It is trying to attack with poverty and political chaos where it cannot yet attack with missiles. Interesting. This is an interesting one. This is from uh, September the 13th, uh, just a, a week or so ago. A desperate Turkey cozies up to Iran and Russia. If you remember the, the previous slide, these were some countries that we saw Russia would have influence over based on the alignment of nations in Ezekiel 38. And here's a headline that basically says exactly that. Turkey and Iran cooperating with Russia. And there's the leaders all shaking hands. And of course, this is just from this week um, that uh, Putin has called up hundreds of thousands of troops. Uh, Zelensky in his speech to the United Nations that was broadcast in uh, from the Ukraine, he, he called for the just punishment for Russia. And uh, at the same time, Putin was, was threatening nuclear weapons as he mobilized the 300,000 reservists to fight in Ukraine. Now, what's, what's going on here? What's, how, how is this a threat? What's, what's the positioning here? Well, the suggestion is, is that uh, what Putin is going to do is those parts of Ukraine that they've already got influence over, He's, he's going to declare them part of Russia so that when Ukraine and with the help of the West tries to reclaim those parts of, of the Ukraine, um, he'll see that as an attack on Russia 
and an excuse, therefore, for war, most likely World War III. In fact, as we speak, even today, there's referendum, referendums being held in many of these areas, the, the Russian-occupied areas of the Ukraine, where people are asked, do you want to become part of Russia? You know, tick the box. And in fact, just this past week on September the 21st, in a televised address to the Russian nation, Putin said the following, if the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we will without doubt use all available means to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff. End of quote. Now, some think that that means exactly it is a bluff, but we will see. The point is, you can see how he's positioning that. If you attack Russia, we will do whatever it takes to defend ourselves, even nuclear weapons. Of course, the Russia he's referring to in that case are parts of former other countries, particularly the Ukraine at this time. So what we see then in these headlines when we compare them to Bible prophecy is that the nations are aligning as the Bible predicted. Uh, there's a north and west, sorry, a north and south divide, an east and west divide. These, these alignments of nations, Russia with Iran and, and Turkey, uh, Britain with, with um, America and, and Israel. These were all alignments that the Bible spoke of. It's interesting, um, John Thomas in 1850 wrote a book called Russia Triumphant, Europe Chained. So he, would, he believed that the Bible predicted uh, that Europe would somehow be um, chained by Russia, made impotent in some way. We don't know if that's going to be economically or militarily or politically, uh, but we can be certain that it's going to happen. We may not know how, we may not know when, but we do know it will happen. <clears throat> And I think we're starting to see some of that in the, the posturing and the positioning uh, of the nations, uh, even as we speak. Now, the other nation that obviously features uh, a lot and heavily in, uh, in Bible prophecy is Israel. Uh, we've seen some of these already. Uh, Israel will return to their homeland after centuries of dispersion. They will return generally and in unbelief of Jesus as the Messiah. Most of them it will be as... as, as uh, traders and, and farmers, and, and now we see a te technological boom in that part of the, of the world. There are, of course, Orthodox Jews who hold to the Old Testament, and there are a few who would have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. But the scripture indicates that for the most part, it's unbelief uh, in, in many of uh, the prophecies uh, that scripture predicted. Uh, Israel would be supported and protected by Britain and Western allies. They would regain control of Jerusalem and the, the mountains of Israel. They would change the wastelands to gardens, becoming prosperous and confident. Uh, they would be besieged by their enemies, calling for the destruction. Psalm 83 is an incredible uh, prophecy about the, the antagonism that they would have with the nations surrounding them. And certainly we see that with you know, the PLO and, and Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, their rhetoric that they, they would speak freely today are, are repeated in many of the words in that psalm. It's, it's fascinating. Again, I would encourage you to check out all these passages and, and uh, confirm these things for yourself. You know, if we were thinking about the where are we in, in these prophecies, I would say we're still here. Look at this. Nations will argue and debate about how, how to divide the land. We're going to look at that more closely later. Jerusalem will be attacked. You are here. We're somewhere between you know, the, 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 the returning to the land and being in conflict and having the land divided to be actually physically um, invaded by this northern force that, that uh, Ezekiel 38 speaks of and Zechariah 14. But Jesus will return uh, uh, with, with the resurrected saints and save uh, Israel from utter annihilation. And they will acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah. So we're through a lot of those, and yet we can see what's coming in the future, uh, and we can be assured because all these previous things have been fulfilled, we can be assured the last few check boxes will also be checked. So what do we see when we look at the headlines? Well, this is a little bit older, a couple of, a few years ago now, 
uh, when they discovered oil and gas uh, off the coast of Israel and are developing those uh, fields. But now as that comes online, where's it going? This is a relatively recent uh, move here. Israel hammers out a deal to supply natural gas to Europe via Egypt. Well, that's interesting because the Bible says that Russia is going to come down into Israel and Egypt. Why would they do that? And notice Britain's involved here. Uh, a British company announces new gas discovery off the Israeli coast. And so Israel has become even more prosperous because of these um, discoveries. Uh, the United Arab Emirates foreign minister uh, is on an official visit uh, to Israel. And then this is hot off the press. This is from the, the UN General Assembly uh, just this past week, where the Prime Minister Lapid, Prime Minister of, uh, of Israel, says here he's going to make a historic announcement that, Isra that the Israelis will support a Palestinian state. And he's going to make that statement at the UN. And the article went on to say, and this was actually before it happened, they were predicting this was going to happen based on, oh, you know, the, some leak or something. And it actually did happen. He got up and it marked the first time an Israeli prime minister has declared support for a two-state solution at the UN, at the United Nations Assembly. Uh, Israel said, we support a two-state solution. And, and there is uh, Prime Minister Lapid on the left with the, um, the, general, uh, the Secretary General of the UN on the right there, and they're shaking hands. Now, I'd like to get your Bibles out again. Um, this this is, is, uh, is fascinating. I'd like you to go to Joel chapter 2. Uh, Joel is one of the prophecies that's in that long list from the previous chapter about Israel. And this one in particular, in chapter 3, um, I think it's worth looking at. Joel chapter 3. Now let's just read from verse 1. It says, For behold, in those days, and that's biblical language for the last days, the days just before Christ's return, which is spoken about in chapter 2. So as we come now into chapter 3, it says, Behold, in those days, in that time when I, God is saying, Bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, the captivity of Judah was returned, well, you know, with that captivity returned in 1948. They had Judea as part of the land that they uh, claimed and, and defended in the War of Independence. But it waited until 1967, the Six-Day War, when they had, the, they had control of Jerusalem. So you can mark that right in your Bible. You are here because 1948 and 1967. Verse 2 goes on to say, and I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now, all nations have not yet been gathered into Israel, but it will happen. You are here. But why is God pleading with the nations? What, what is God upset about? Why is he going to judge the nations? Because they scattered his people and, di and divided or parted his land. So from the very time of the British mandate after the First World War, all through that time, the United Nations got together and they had a map of, of, of Palestine and they started dividing it up. Jordan was able to have this. The Palestinians would have this. Uh, the, the Jews would have this. This would be Israel. They were parting the land. And all the time there would be other people saying, oh, no, 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 that, this is our land, say the Palestinians. We were here first. And, and the Jews say, are you kidding? Are you kidding? We were here since the times of, time of David. You know, 3,000 years ago, we had a kingdom here. Um, the point is they're all wrong. From the Bible, it's very clear. God says they parted my land. And that's what's upset God. They're acting like they can divide the land and decide who gets what. God promised that land to Abraham and to Abraham's seed or descendant, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's God land, God's land, and he's going to give it to whomsoever he chooses. It's interesting here that uh, Le, this uh, Prime Minister Lapid would uh, make this uh, claim that he's willing now to divide the land, to, to agree to a two-state solution, uh, because a former Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, was assassinated in 1995 by a fellow Israeli, an extremist. Why? because Rabin had signed the Oslo Accords and made overtures of peace towards the Palestinians. 
So this has been tried before and it didn't work out too well for the prime minister. We don't know what's gonna happen here. Uh, we don't know how far this is gonna go. Already there's been some railing against this from both sides, Jews and Arabs, I uh, think it's not a good idea. Um, but it's, it's a popular thought amongst the United Nations to, to, to bring peace. They think they can bring peace, peace. And Joel chapter three says, no, they can talk about peace, but they can't do it by dividing my land. Um, intervention uh, of a divine nature is coming. Now, one other slide here, this is brand new again. This is September 20. This headline jumped out at me, innovation for uh, prosperity. Remember the, the scriptures are clear that Israel is going to be prosperous. Uh, in the last days, just before Jesus returns. And this is based on these uh, Abraham Accords. Here we've got a, a, a Barani hospital announcing historic partnership with an Israeli hosp hospital. So this uh, Sheba Medical Center in Israel and the King Hamad American Mission Hospital in Bahrain um, are going to cooperate. Uh, they're going to share research. They're going to share doctors. They're, they're going to promote medical advancement and, and the, the headline is this is this is a great thing it's going to bring prosperity to both nations and to the world um so these would be what we might call the the lovers of israel uh, and seeing the, the advantage of, of siding with israel but we also have the haters um you know all that went on at the un this week with all the, the talk about uh, the you know trying to bring peace in ukraine and and deal with the climate change and all the disparity and uh, you know, the have nations and the have not nations. The Iranian president got up and took the time in his speech to say the following, amongst other things. Israel is a savage country that kills women and children. So there are those that are outright enemies of Israel and, and, uh, and you know, malign them at any opportunity they get. And it's interesting because uh, Genesis 12 is clear. Um, God said those that bless Israel through Abraham will be blessed and those that curse Abraham and Israel by extension will be cursed. Uh, so we know where this is going to end. Now, we mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, why would Israel be invaded by Russia? What would, what would make is, um, what on earth would make uh, Russia want to come down into Israel? You know, they seem to be kind of bogged down in Ukraine. Where's this all going? Well, here's just a thought. Again, we know that Ezekiel 38 makes it clear Ezekiel 38 says that this northern invader uh, will think an evil thought and he will come down into the glorious land to take a spoil. That's what we know scripture says. We don't know for sure how that's going to be fulfilled or when or why, but we know it will indeed happen because scripture has said it. So here's a thought. Here's a suggestion. This first quote is from uh, 2007, the autumn of 2007, the Washington, Washington Quarterly. The title is EU Energy Security, Time to End Russian Leverage. Moscow's entire energy strategy is predicated on continuing extending and extending, expanding its dominant market position in Europe and Eurasia. This position can only be maintained if Russia holds a near monopoly on pipelines into Europe and out of Central Asia. The Kremlin recognizes this fact and has vigorously fought all attempts to construct non-Russian controlled pipes from the Caspian region and Central Asia to Europe. Moscow, Moscow can only extract favorable conditions when it deals with states bilaterally and plays them against each other. So even in 2007, people could see that Russia was moving to control the energy to, that was sent into Europe. And then um, here, just in December of last year, CNN said, checkmate, Putin has the West cornered and it's all about controlling the energy and remember just a few slides ago Zelensky saw this from Ukraine he said you know he we're fighting with against conventional weapons here in Ukraine but the rest of Europe's going to face uh the the energy weapons uh you know gas pipelines used as weapons where you know Russia just turns off the power and uh there's there's many who think this is going to have a devastating effect on Europe this coming winter well, what's that got to do with Israel? Well, as we've seen, Israel has gas and, and oil and gas off its coasts, and it's constructing a pipeline that'll they'll send the gas to Egypt where, where it will be uh, refined and then sent into Europe. Well, this is from August 24th of this year. Israel plans gas exports to Europe 
as output surges by 22%, and the royalties are up 50%, and there's a trilateral deal to increase shipment, shipments to the European Union. Well, is this a reason for Russia to want to invade Israel? Is this perhaps the spoil? Is, is what Israel doing here undermining the plans that Russia has to, to chain Europe and to, to dominate them? Perhaps, we don't know. If not this, it will probably be something very much like it. So what does this Bible say about Great Britain and her allies? Now we've mentioned this quite a bit and we'll go through this quickly now. A Great Britain will be a merchant power and materialistically prosperous. There'll be an alliance uh, with nations south of Israel. And Daniel 11 talks about the king of the north and the king of the south being at odds and that the king of the south will push at the king of the north. Um, now, Britain and America and the Western allies have all kinds of military and air force bases in the nations that are, are south of, um, of Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE, these areas are um, influenced by and positioned with, aligned with uh, the Western nations, uh, Britain and her allies. Um, so we've seen those alignments come to pass. And these nations will be a counterbalance to the nations north of Israel. Uh, they're identified as the mother lion with her young lions, and that's certainly an apt description that we've heard talked about quite a bit uh, this past week with the, the, the Queen's funeral. Um, it talked about the Commonwealth nations, you know, India and Canada and Australia, New Zealand, and to some extent, extent um, the USA, aligned together against uh, the, the threat that comes out of, you know, Iran and, and Russia and, and these places. They will oppose or at least challenge the Russian invasion of Israel, and they will accept Christ as king and lay down their crowns at his feet. These, these uh, you know, the, the, the young lions and, and Tarshish and the young lions. Again, where are we there? Probably the second last bullet. You are here. It's going to happen. All these other things have. So how do we see this in the headlines? Well, um, again, the U.S. approves a massive arms sale to Saudi, the UAE, to counter Iran. You can see that's the same nations. Uh, and remember, we're not taking headlines and trying to make them fit into the Bible. We read the Bible first, see what it says, and these headlines just speak the same things. They're, they're showing the fulfillment of these many promises because God knew the end from the beginning and was able to predict these things. Here we see the UK is involved as well in a trade deal, improving a trade deal uh, with the, um, the Gulf states. So we see then an alignment of nations according to, to Daniel 11. The terms in Daniel 11 are the king of the north and the king of the south. Um, this is biblical language. We also see it as east and west. There's two legs in the, the, uh, the image in Daniel 2, and the east and west divide. Um, so so that the Bible language we see fulfilled in the alignment of nations today. And of course, this is based on all relative to Israel. Um, now, just go to Psalm 72. We, we mentioned it earlier, and I just found it interesting in light of the events of this past week uh, and the fact that in Scripture, uh, we have the king of the north and the king of the south. Well, Psalm 72 is, is an amazing prophecy. You may not think of Psalms as prophecies, but they are, many of them. Um, we've alluded to, to Psalm 83. Psalm 2 is another amazing one. But here you can see it's talking about this time when Jesus is king of the earth. Verse 1, give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the kingly son. So Jesus will return as the son of God, also the son of David, and sit upon the throne and give judgment from that throne in Jerusalem. He'll judge the people with righteousness and the poor with judgment or justice and equity. Uh, the mountains will bring forth peace and so on. So this is a kingdom picture. Notice that in verse 10, the kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. So when Jesus returns and sets up kings, they are going to be some nations favorable to him and they will bring presents. And notice it's the same alignment. You've got the kings of Tarshish and the Isles, and also Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. So we've got this same alignment. Now, I find it interesting that for the first time in over 70 years, Britain has a king with no, nothing but kings coming forward in, the, in the, the lineage, shall we say. So 
perhaps this verse here in Psalm 72 has even more meaning and more relevance today than it did even two weeks ago, uh, because there is a king of Tarshish, and he will, uh, as it says there, bring presence or support Jesus when God's kingdom is established on the earth. Now, Europe gets a little bit of a short shift in our uh, discussion and our presentation this afternoon. I apologize for that. If you're interested, reach out to us via the, the Barry Christadelphians uh, email address. Happy to engage you in more discussion. But what does the Bible say about Europe? Many, many passages would go together to show that Britain wasn't going to be a part of the EU. We've mentioned that. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was gonna ha will have a strong influence uh, in European politics. That's something that's clear from Scripture especially Daniel chapter 2, where the, the Roman legs of the image, the iron legs, come down in some way into the last stage of the image, the feet and the toes that are part of iron and part of clay. So uh, the, 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 the Roman element is still there, we see in the, uh, the Catholic Church. And of course, it's been very involved in the formation of uh, the European Confederacy and ultimately the European Union. Um, so we've seen this, this already. This next one is where we're at. You are here, right here. Uh, when Jesus returns, these nations will oppose Jesus. In contrast to, the, to Tarshish, who will accept him. That's another reason she had to be separate from Europe. Uh, these nations, the, the, the European Catholic nations, will oppose Jesus when he returns to set himself up as king in Jerusalem. Now, again, that's very quickly. Sorry for the... The, the shortness of that, we are running out of time, but Ezekiel 6, sorry, Revelation 16 through 18 uh, speaks more about this. And again, happy to engage you in further discussion if you just reach out to us. But this has been acknowledged. Here's some graphics. Britain separated from Europe, uh, the Europe and the church intertwined, you know, the stars of Europe, the European flag, the European Union and the, the, the church um, connected. Uh, very, very, very deep roots. Now we couldn't, uh, we're going to wrap up soon. We couldn't finish, uh, certainly without talking about the queen, um, and the queen uh, passing away at the age of 96 after 70 years on the throne. And of course, this week we've uh, witnessed her, her funeral. Um, it's interesting that her funeral was attended by over 500 heads of state and dignitaries. Uh, billions of people uh, watched the, the funeral procession. In fact, the estimates are, the estimates are up to 4 billion people watched it worldwide. That's over half the population of the earth uh, watching this. And it's interesting that uh, the queen, who scripted what her funeral service was to be, had many, many scriptures read and hymns sung that spoke about the return of Christ, who, who she followed. She claimed that as she was a servant the people, she was also servant to the king, uh, and, and her king was Jesus. She made that unabashedly. Um, there was there was references to the resurrection uh, and and Christ's return that were were read and sung at her funeral. First Corinthians fifteen, for example. I, I find that I find that fascinating. And over here on this side, we have the queen two days before her death was welcoming the new prime minister, Liz Truss. Um, and who knew that uh, with two days after this photo was taken, uh, she would she would be dead, and so this seventy year time period would be over. Um, now, just interestingly, this Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister of of Britain, um, wrote a book with along with some other people that's entitled Britain Unchained. And I just thought that just jumped out at me when I saw that Britain Unchained, disconnected from from Europe, more in tune with these other nations, and of course. If Europe is going to be chained, Britain is going to be unchained. I don't think she had any context of the, the biblical passages we were talking about, the prophecies, but nonetheless, there it is. Now, the 70 year which would drop out, it would jump out at uh, any, any Bible student. Uh, 70 is a very, very uh, special number in scripture. That's why the fact that it was the 77th Assembly of the United Nations also jumped out at me. Seven is an important um, Bible number. But 70, look at this, Isaiah 23, Tyre, which is modern day Britain, Tyre moved to Tarshish and Tarshish is Britain. Tyre shall be gotten, forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king or one monarch. So is it coincidence that, that uh, Elizabeth held on 
the longest reigning monarch, 70 years. After the end of 70 years, shall Tyre sing as a harlot. And it shall come to pass after the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre, another name for modern Britain and the merchandising powers that are associated with her. And shall commit fornication with all the kings of the world upon the face of the earth. Now we should note, note here that harlotry and fornication are uh, spiritually. Uh, in the scriptures, it's spoken of those that are unfaithful to God. Israel committed adultery and played the harlot to God. Um, so this is spiritual harlotry or fornication. Um, so there's some sense in which at the end of these 70 years, Britain would, would lose uh, her connection to God, you know, and how will we ever see a monarch who, who unabashedly and, and openly claimed her allegiance to Jesus and had her funeral so infused with scriptures about Jesus' return and the resurrection? We may never see that again. And in fact, King Charles uh, has started to make a move from, from his mother. Yes, he believes in God, but is it just the, the, the Christian faith or other faith? So there was some debate as to whether he would be the defender of the faith or just defender of faiths. And um, he's backed away from that a little bit. Um, in, in 1994, as just the Prince Charles, he triggered controversy when he said that he would be defender of faith rather than defender of that, of the faith. Um, he's backed away from that a little bit, but as early as uh, recent as September the 16th of this year, he said to the media that his plan was to protect the space for faith general. So you'd allow kind of a, allow all faiths to sort of co-inhabit, which is certainly a, a, a modern 21st century concept, isn't it? The space for faith. Will he ever be as bold as his mother? We will see. So is the world out of control? Well, the answer to that is yes. The United Nations Secretary General certainly thinks so. But no, it's not out of control. There is hope. So Jesus himself said the following in Luke 21, there will be signs in the sun, the moon and the stars and on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. And the sea there is symbolic of, of the nations just, you know, at war and in tumult. And, um, you know, the sun, moon and stars are the, the political heavenlies, if you will, the heavenly bodies that will be shaken. You know, the, the fact that we've had a, a queen a set, who reigned for 70 years, it's as if a light's gone out. Um, this is what this is speak, speaking of here in symbol. And Jesus said, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. The world seems to be out of control. So you are here, verse 26 of Luke 21. But it goes on to say, at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. As surely as the first two verses will have been fulfilled, you are here at verse 26. Verse 27, Jesus will come back. So Jesus says, this is really important for us in you know, 2022 to, to listen here. He says, when you see these things begin to take place, we have. These things have begun to take place. Not all of them, but many of them. He says, when you see these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So we can have hope that the world, although it seems out of control, is actually in the control of God, that he has a plan. It's fulfilling Bible prophecy, and part of that prophecy is a wonderful hope. This is an amazing verse, Daniel 4, 17. Uh, this, is, this matters by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word by the word of the holy ones. And why? Why did God give all these prophecies? What was God's purpose in revealing these things? To the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the lowliest of men. God is in control. He decides who's going to be king, who's going to be prime minister, who's going to be emperor, who's going to be president. God decides who rules in the kingdom of men. But the amazing thing is the lowliest of men who will ultimately take over from the kingdom of men and set up the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ himself. And we look forward to that day. So what has God promised? The earth will be restored. There will be no more death. Eternal life is, is a gift that God has promised. An end to pain and suffering. There will be peace, true peace, not false peace, true peace. The earth will be restored. There will be righteous rulership. 
And of course, that will take place when Jesus returned, returns. You know, the world that you want to live in, the world that you want to raise your kids and grandkids in is coming. It may not look like it now, but we can be assured that that world is coming when Jesus returns to establish God's kingdom on earth. And, and, and so things will be done on earth as they are in heaven. You know, this amazing prophecy in, in Isaiah chapter 2, this is an artist's rendition of what the temple might look like. Ezekiel uh, 40 to 48 describes this temple in great detail, and, and one person uh, are, drew it like this. But read these words of, of hope uh, from, Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is the hope that we have. And so when we think of this question, is the world out of control or fulfilling Bible prophecy? We know the answer is yes, it is out of control. And yes, it is fulfilling prof Bible prophecy. And so I hope and my prayer for you is that you will take comfort in the fact that despite the appearance of the world being out of control, you can be assured that God is in control and has a wonderful plan for you in for your life and for this planet on which we all live. I thank you for your careful and kind attention. And I encourage you to look up these Bible passages uh, that we've uh, that we've looked at very briefly today. Reach out to the Barry Christadelphians at barrychristadelphians at gmail.com and and ask for these ask for this presentation. It will be this video will be available online as well as all the slides as a PDF. So thanks when I, once again. Uh, take care and God bless.